buddy Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, it's Monday here on the show. If you're one of our YouTube top tier subscribers, Twitch homies, you're probably wondering where in the heck is Brian today? Well, I'm in lovely San Francisco, California. And in fact, on Friday, I will be live from the Sports Byline studio, so that's going to be very exciting. For today, you'll have to see me in front of this beautiful wall as I talk all of the news with Mike Sempervivi. And it is the weekend, and so we have a lot of news to talk about. And as always, not all of it is good news. We'll get into the raw recap here, the preview here in a moment. But obviously, the big news today is Shinjiro Otani. Shinjiro Tani remains paralyzed following injury suffered in a 0-1 show on Sunday. Company president Takehito Kami spoke to Tokyo Sports on Monday, confirmed Otani's condition remains unchanged. It has not changed, he said. He is conscious but cannot move his limbs. Currently, he's being treated by a doctor. As for the official diagnosis, we are waiting for a reply from the hospital. 49-year-old Otani took a German suplex into the turnbuckle, during the night's main event and was unable to move afterwards. The ring ropes were removed. The fans were asked to leave. Otani was eventually stretchered out and taken to the hospital. He'd been challenging the promotion's world champion, Takashi Sagira. He performed from New Japan from 92 to 2001, co-founded Zero One with Shinya Hashimoto. Uh, 1998 team with uh, Tetsuhiro Takeiwa won Tag Team of the Year in the Observer Awards. He was also named Best Technical Wrestler that same year. So obviously it's going to be a while before we know, you know, what happened and whether or not he can make a full recovery or to what degree he can make a recovery. But obviously pro wrestling has dangers and we could talk about this after the break and not just the danger of any particular spot, but the danger of years of wear and tear. So we'll talk about that and all the rest of the news back in a moment with more Observer Live. Obviously the bad news out of the way first, Otani. And uh, we'll know more, presumably... As time goes on, and I hope the best for him. Uh, sometimes when these things happen, it takes a while for the swelling to go down. And once the swelling goes down, people can uh, slowly regain feeling in their arms and legs. But right now, he does not have any. And uh, that's certainly not good. And uh, it, is a, it is a cautionary tale that uh, it's pro wrestling. And uh, it, is, uh, it has worked, you know. The winners and losers are pretty determined. The idea that uh, every bump is a minor car crash is is uh, overstated, but it is dangerous, and it can be very dangerous. And this this story, what it what it always reminds me of is, you know, you see uh, you see these guys taking bumps on their heads, necks, and everything like that. And Regal, you know, he did that that podcast with Jericho and talked about it. And it's not even so much what happens on a particular bump. But it is the years and years of accumulated damage where all of a sudden one day it can all go wrong. And that was the situation with uh, Misawa. Everyone knows that story. An internal decapitation. He took a, a high angle suplex and it was a suplex he'd taken not only many times before, but a lot of the times when he took that, that suplex, he landed worse. But uh, this was the one where after years and years, it was one too many and you know, a German suplex into the buckles, I have not seen it. I mean, maybe it was the move itself went horribly wrong. But my guess is it probably didn't go... Hor I mean, it went horribly wrong, but I think the bigger issue is that the accumulated damage to his neck, it was one bump too many. And that's why, you know, Regal and many others have, have pointed out for a long time, don't land on your neck, don't land on your head. Doesn't matter if you wake up and a couple days later you feel fine, don't do it. So here we are wishing all the best to Otani. Hopefully uh, we get good news over the next couple of days. But uh, right now all we know is conscious, can talk, can't move his limbs. And so uh, hoping for the best. Absolutely. A legend. And, you know, similar situation, Pero Aguayo against Rey Mysterio, where just bounded against the ropes and, and whatever happened, happened there. And it's just, it's sad. And Shinjiro Otani is a, he really is a legend. You know, he's been around so long now. I don't know if people realize that during the golden age of junior heavyweight wrestling in Japan, 
the style that influenced so many of the people that you see on your TVs today, he was a very important part of that. He was the first ever WCW Cruiserweight Champion. He had feuds with Jushin Liger and Liger's partner, El Samurai, and Ultimo Dragon and Chris Benoit when he was Wild Pegasus and all of those guys. Eddie is Black Tiger. He was the man, and he had a team with Koji Kanemoto and later on uh, Takaiwa. I mean, him and Kanemoto would go at it. They were great partners, great enemies, fantastic stuff. And then did Hustle, went with Hashimoto, did Zero One. And it has, to this day, Zero One has been around for a long time. A lot of people thought it was going to fail and die plenty of times. And it has survived because he and Masato Tanaka, uh, for a long time, were the ones really grinding it out. And since Tanaka has kind of stepped back a little bit, Otani has been that guy. And he's been going, you know, as hard as Otani can go. And he's 49 years old. And all the best to him. I just want him to have a good quality of life. And I hope... He does recover his feelings and just things work out for the best. You know, somebody on the chat here said, uh, can't believe that Seth Rollins still doing the buckle bomb after what happened to Sting. That's my point. There is nothing inherently wrong with a buckle bomb. If you deliver the buckle bomb right and the person takes the buckle bomb right, it's not all that different from being whipped across and taking a hard buckle. The issue was that Sting had been wrestling for years and years and years, and whatever happened, happened on that buckle bomb. Now, the the running buckle bomb into the barricade outside, I don't like that one because the barricade is padded, but unlike the, the top turnbuckle with the ropes, there is no give. And so you're hitting that uh, you're hitting that barricade pretty hard, and if you get thrown too hard, you land too high on a on a barricade, a padded barricade. And if you're not thrown hard enough, you really land wrong, and then you you splat on the ground. And that's how Finn Balor got hurt when Seth hit him with the buckle bomb into the barricade. I don't like that one, but a normal safe buckle bomb into the top turnbuckle that is not an inherently dangerous move. And the other thing is. You know, if we want to start banning every move where somebody has gotten injured, then, yeah, there are going to be a few moves that probably aren't safe to do one way or the other. Um, you know, I'm not big into banning moves, but uh, that finisher that Penta and Phoenix do where, you know, the guy gets dropped on his neck in, like, the double pile driver position, dude, I've seen that one go wrong way too many times. And if there's a move that is going wrong way too many times... I don't think that necessarily, like, there are a lot of moves that Penta and Phoenix can do. But every move, you can probably find an example of somebody getting hurt on virtually every move. I hurt myself on a snake eyes once. I thought the ground was going to be there. It wasn't. My leg was too straight. I had presented my knee. Should I be calling for the snake eyes to be banned? Of course not. You know, something went wrong. I mean, are we going to ban getting in the ring because Vince McMahon tore two quads? Are we going to ban walking in the ring because Kevin Nash tore a quad? Of course not. Things are going to happen. And if a move is is injuring a lot of people, if a move is constantly going wrong, that's one thing. But a move that you've seen, you know, 500 times and one time somebody gets hurt, that's going to happen in wrestling. It's just, you know, the nature of wrestling. You're going to get hurt. And quite frankly, often you're going to get hurt doing something that you probably shouldn't have gotten hurt doing. It was just some fluke, some fluke deal. People calling for the banning of the snake eyes. Get out of here. <laughs> Nash should be down to two moves. Well, if you yeah. had to ban a move, is there one off the top of your head that you go, you know what, if I had, if I was yeah, King I'll Brian tell you right for now. a day, what is I'll it? I'll tell you right now. The tree slam. Ah. Tree slam. I right. I hate that move. And uh, listen, the the thing to me with with most moves, okay, is it either has to be a move where the person doing it is capable of of depositing you on the mat safely ninety nine times out of a hundred, or you take your own bump and put yourself on the mat safely. I have seen that tree slam go wrong. So many times. I don't really want to bring this up because it was like it was an accident or something like that. But uh, I think the guy's name was uh, was it Brian Ong? Remember, Great Kali was training at like All Pro and yeah, and, APW, uh, APW, and that guy, you know, he was he was killed. 
And uh, it was an accident. Like, it wasn't great. Great Collie wasn't trying to kill the guy. But I'm pretty sure it was uh, he was practicing the tree slam. Because the tree slam, it's always, first off, it's always done by a tall guy. So first off, you're way too high. Then the guy has to throw you. And he has to, he has to basically, I don't know if time it is the right word, but he has to do it in such a way that you're going to fall and you're going to land flat on your back exactly when you're supposed to on the mat. You either land too high and you land on the back of your head or you don't rotate enough and you land on your uh, uh, buttocks, Dom. And then not only do you land on your tailbone, but then your head snaps back and hits the mat. If you watch tree slams, way more than 50% of the time, it's it's a bad landing for the person who's getting tree slammed, and they have no control over the bump. You're absolutely 100%. Your life is in the hands of the tall guy who's who's slamming you. So that is one that I would restrict. And there are those times, too, with that move where the person in their excitement basically slams the person down as hard as they can, which is, you know, rarer. But that happens a lot with those high angle power bombs and those moves that who was it? Was it Grayson Waller? Who was the one that actually did that uh, razor's edge or whatever it was where they just completely killed? The yeah, guy. that's another one that like that be- is where. Yeah, it, it's not. Even, I think it's the uh, the Splash Mountain. Because if you watch the normal Razor's Edge, like Razor Ramon put him down perfect, like, you know, 99% of the time. But the one where you lift him up like that and then toss him, oh, no the good. Oh, toss? Oh, I hated that. Oh. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Yes, it is spring break for me. Although it's not really much of a break. In fact, it's exactly, it's exactly like being at home, except now i got to hang out with a dog all day. Or visiting my, uh, I guess it would be my sister-in-law. My wife's sister had twins, and so we're here to uh, help out. And they've also got a dog. So I've been hanging around with this dog. Uh-huh. He's the bane of my existence, dog. It's actually a very nice dog. What kind of dog? I don't know, big white dog. Like It's a big like dog. A golden Retriever? Yeah, no, I don't know what kind right. of dog it is. It's a big fluffy dog. It's not a golden brought, retriever. All that equipment that you brought down there, and you didn't bring a mic stand or a, anything like that? I never that. bring you, a mic stand. You go, you going Dave style? I, I always go Dave style on the road. I never bring a mic stand. Why is that? Because the mic stand's too heavy to pack, number one. And number two, this table, as you can see from my camera angle, the table's so far down there that I would need like a giant... I just hold the mic. It's easier. When you're not traveling with your family, do you still travel like wrestling style? You just take one gym bag, roll all the t-shirts Dude, up, and all listen, that. I got I got one little tiny mini suitcase that that uh, holds this gimmick that I use to connect, and literally everything else I have is in that backpack right there. I've got all my clothes. I've got headphones. I've got mic. I've got cables. I've got my uh, accoutrement bag. Everything I need is in that one backpack. Meanwhile, these uh, these ladies, if you saw how many suitcases they brought, holy smokes, I got a two-year-old. She has more clothes than I do <laughs> packed for this trip. Just go with the game changer in Atlantic City. Just brought like four suitcases. Like It's Atlantic City. Just by default, you're going to be one of the better people there, for heaven's sakes. You know, it's crazy. But <laughs> it's... did you ever have a problem going through the airport with any of the gimmicks now for the for the show? Like, well, looking at the box, hey, listen, wondering, like, all right, what's going I'll, on here? I'll tell you that story here in a second. But I got to go over this first because I'm in San Francisco. And I all feel right. we should alternate news with this jibber jabber. So anyway, I'm in San Francisco, but I did not go to the GCW show yesterday. Uh, Number one, because I wouldn't have been able to make it on time. And I'm actually not in San Francisco. I'm north. But anyway, multiple talents did not appear at Sunday's GCW Devil in a New Dress show in San Francisco. In addition to Bandito, Gringo Loco did not wrestle as advertised. No explanation was given, and they have not responded to a request for comment on Loco not wrestling. Jacob Fatu... Did not appear at the show. They announced he had travel problems. Biff Busick, travel problems, inability to make Sunday show, or announced in a tweet Sunday afternoon. And, uh, and of course, Bandito was set to face Nick Wayne. Nick Wayne was going to get a match with Bandito, and Bandito no-showed. You all know why. Scared. He's scared. Yeah. He was scared to go and lose to a 16-year-old. Mm-hmm. 17, yeah. I think. 17, no. No, he's not. He's 16. Is he still 16? Unless I wasn't invited to his birthday, which I'd be it's very, possible. very 
I was in his first birthday for crying out loud. I better be invited to his 17th. <laughs> Not that I'd show up, but I better be invited. <laughs> so he faced Effie instead. So it's certainly a unique switch in the position. Well, I'm looking at it. Well, wouldn't he have been? The, would he have been the main event with Bandito, or did he go from the main event to the opener because of Bandito? I well, I mean, obviously, all the focus was on a lot of the focus was on Bandito and Nick for that night. So certainly mine was. Man, but oh man, can you well, believe that? Well, you know, I guess it also proves that was Bandito I in the still country have never been seen in the same place at the same time Stop with the Bandito. So, uh... Was, was like, Bandito in the country? I mean, I couldn't make it down there on time either. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was going to say, why didn't Hispanic. you... I am Hispanic. Why didn't you bring your gear? Isn't that part of the rule? Because I couldn't fit in this backpack with my other stuff. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about the airport, okay? Uh, so, right. uh, I once went to the airport, and back in the day... So you guys understand, like, oh, it looks so easy, Brian, going to California and doing the show. No, no, it's taken it's taken 15 years to figure out how to make this go smoothly, okay? So back in the day, you know, what I used to have to bring when I went on trips, I had to bring so much stuff back in the day to, by the way, have much worse quality shows than we have nowadays. But I had mics and I had cables and I would bring along, you know, a compressor, blah, 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 blah. So I had this this uh, this suitcase that was full. Like, you opened it up, and it was like a whole studio in there. And uh, I would bring this, and I would I would take it through security and everything like that. So uh, uh, one day, I'm going through security, and uh, I can't even remember what it was that got flagged. But it was it was like, I don't know a jacket or a pair of pants or it was it was something where they stop you the red light goes on they come over they want to look at your pants they want the dog the the drug sniffing dog they want to move their magic wand over and everything like that so it was it was over something stupid it was like a, a pair of pants or a pair of shoes or i don't even know what it was but meanwhile i had a suitcase filled with wires and mechanical devices, it, lo- it literally looked like a bomb that just f- slid right on through. Oh, don't worry about that thing with all the wires and gadgets. But that pair of pants, that pair of pants, who knows? There might be kerosene on those pants. So anyway, I didn't get stopped this time. Don't leave your half gram of Coke in there, and that wouldn't happen that time. There was nothing in there. There was literally nothing in there. I can't remember what it was, but it was something dumb. You think anyway. maybe that was a smoke screen so they could look at your other stuff or something like that to make they sure they want to look at my weren't? jacket? The I guy's like, know. "Oh, that's a nice jacket. I need to see where he gets that." Who else was oh, around? Oh, Patagonia. Things, okay, <laughs> maybe he was taking your attention away, and they He's were from to Seattle. Look at clearly. Else. <laughs> All right, listen. Tonight is uh, raw. You guys ready for oh, that? No. Yeah, I thought I had a lineup, but I don't. Oh, yeah, Trump I do. There. Okay. Well. Yeah, uh, Tomasa Ciampa has been uh, uh, drafted to Raw, apparently. So that was on PW Insider today. We have got uh, Sasha Banks and Naomi versus Liv and Rhea for the SmackDown Women's Tag Team titles, or the just the Women's Tag Team titles. There is a tease, by the way, on SmackDown, if you wanted the SmackDown report. There is a tease that they're going to unify the Men's Tag Team titles as well. So I know they're all into the brand extension and everything like that, but, I mean, we've been talking about this for years. Why don't they just unify all the belts? You can have your two brands, but just send your champions brand to brand, whatever. Maybe they're actually doing it because now they're teasing another another title unification. We have Damien Priest, AJ Styles. Veer will face Rey Mysterio. MVP will host the VIP lounge with his own guy, Omos. Roman Reigns and the Usos versus Drew and New Day is advertised for the dark match. And yes, in his first Raw match in, I believe, six years, Cody Rhodes is facing The Miz. Okay? So yesterday, uh, maybe it was whatever day I watched SmackDown, I heard that uh, Cody Rhodes was facing The Miz, and I thought, all right, that's fine. It's easy match, you know, beat the guy or whatever. So then I foolishly, I went on I went on Twitter, and every now and then, you know, they have trending on the side, 
which is like, you know, whatever's trending that they think you would be interested in. And uh, one of them was uh, The Miz. I thought, why is The Miz trending? I always get worried when people are trending because I'm like, I hope something bad didn't happen. So uh, I foolishly clicked on uh, The Miz's name because it was trending. Oh, my God. What? So apparently, apparently when this match was announced, uh, the internet went crazy. I was unaware of this till I clicked on this this uh, name. <laughs> so first, there were like a bunch of people that were angry, like angry, that Cody was going to face The Miz, okay? Angry? I don't know why you would be angry. Like, who cares? But they were actually angry about it. Like, Cody's just come back in his first match. Uh, Brian Danielson debuted his first match with Kenny Omega. Cody's debuting his matches with The Miz? And so then, you know, all the people that were angry, you know, were going off about how much The Miz sucked, okay? Which, uh, that's right, I understand that. But then we had all of the, the pro-Miz people that had to come to the defense of The Miz. Oh, my God. He's a legend, you know, Brian. Bro, I'm praying that Tony Khan is right and that most of these people are bots, okay? Because there's, like, the stuff that people were writing, like, oh, how can you say that The Miz sucks? He's a, he's a grand slam. They were literally doing what he does in his promos, which is, I'm going to rattle off a list of all of the belts that Miz has won to prove that he is, in fact, great. And that you cannot say anything bad about The Miz. It's one thing to say, you know, whatever. But to say that Miz is not good in the ring. Oh, you must be a troll. Look at all these belts he's... I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. You can't, you can't be a real person. So anyway, you know, but then I got thinking about it today. I'm not mad about it. But I was thinking about it and I thought, what is the end goal of Cody and The Miz? Like, is he just going to go in there and beat him in two minutes with the crossroads? Because I can't imagine they're going to go in and go like 19 minutes back and forth. Because that's certainly, absolutely not what I would do with Cody a week after he debuted. Is going toe-to-toe with The Miz for 19 minutes? And it's like, so is he just going to beat him? I mean, I don't know. The more I thought about it, the more I was like, what's the end game here? Shouldn't he go in with somebody like, his first match was with Seth, which was a great match. You know, don't you want to have yeah. him come in and have like some great matches with some guy or something well, like that? No, we got we got to entertain a little bit here. We're gonna have a twelve minute promo back and forth between the two, bantering back and forth, which may be incredibly entertaining. Who knows? Then we're probably gonna have a match. But if you believe that backlash is Logan Paul and the Miz, then you know this. Maybe it's just a quick win for Cody and something to do for this week. You know, but if it's going to be a match for Backlash, I mean, maybe this is where it starts up. So I have a feeling this is not going to lead, though, to what I really want, which, of course, is Brandy and Maurice. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Look at the Twitch chat here. People can't seem to believe. Pro Miz people. He made a event in WrestleMania. He doesn't suck. Dual Grand Slam champ. Why do people actually do that for the? I mean, look, the Miz is somebody that you would probably want your child, depending on what you thought about wrestling, to grow up and be. He's been injured once in the entirety of his career. Uh, he came from a a background of being on MTV, not anything else mtv and that jump started his shot to get to wwe he married maurice he's got a great family he's parlayed this into a career outside of wwe you don't have to quadruple down on ms luthez type of in-ring wizard you can just throw all that to the side and say if you're entertained by the ms and like the ms and think he'll match up well with cody okay you don't have to take it that far no, Dagan, you understand. He's a people trying to get a rise out of me. No, this had nothing to do with me. L- literally nothing. I-, I didn't write or say anything. I went on the internet, and it said <laughs> Miz was trending, so I clicked on his name, and everybody was just going nuts. I had nothing to do with any of this. If you don't, listen, you can all go up there yourself, and, and if you want to click on Miz's name and, and just CM see what everyone's Punk saying I got CM Punk and Tony Dungy right now. What is, what is going go on here it. with Punk and yeah, Tony Dungy? Yeah, what's going Dungy? on with CM Punk? Let's see. CM Punk, top. If CM Punk defeats Hangman Page for the title, Eddie Kingston should dethrone him. It's just, it seems to be just a bunch of people talking about CM Punk. I see. Mm. All right. Hey, listen, we had two shows this weekend. Speaking of uh, AW, we had the Rampage show. 
which uh, are you guys sick of hearing about this one yet? Too bad. Two, uh, two. Uh, well, one was a very good match, and uh, one was actually a uh, it was a great match. Brian Danielson and Trent. I mean, I'd go out of my way to watch it, but uh, unfortunately for these two guys, they were on the undercard. Uh, in fact, every match on this show, like Swerve and QT for five minutes, was a really good match, and. I enjoyed uh, watching Red Velvet get booed against uh, Willow Nightingale since it has to be an angle at this point. This is the third time that they have put her in the ring with a hometown babyface and she's got booed. There's no way that's not by design. So I think Red's ultimately going to be turning heel here. And then, uh, yes, John Moxley and Wheeler Yuta. It's one of those times that I wish I actually had that fight, VPN or whatever, so I could have seen the whole thing unedited. But, you know, even what I got to see was absolutely just... I mean, this is textbook, how to get a guy over and losing, how to make a star in one night. Uh, John Moxley is just, he's so great. When his role is to go in there and win, but get the other guy over, I mean, there's nobody better nowadays, I don't think. Because he did this with, uh, he did this with, I think it was Darby, and then obviously he did this with Wheeler Yuta, and uh, blood and guts, and a, it was a river of blood, just like Moxley had promised. And uh, he couldn't submit the guy. Every move he put him in, a Yuta got out. He couldn't pin the guy, including with his uh, his DDT, which everyone likes to argue about. I need to get Moxley in the show and have him explain the Death Rider and the uh, Paradigm Shift. Because I believe that the Paradigm Shift is the DDT and the Death Rider is the Brain Buster version. And, uh, you know, there are people that are, for some reason, this makes people irrationally furious. Like, no, it's just a paradigm shift. It's only the Death Rider if it's in Japan. One of these days we'll ask him. (laughs) Yeah. Not kidding. Is that like the, well, I guess, hey, the the Yakuza kick and the Mafia kick, I guess, you know, for, for Chono, I guess they would call differently. But anyway, the point is, uh, he hit him with both. The Paradigm Shift and the Death Rider. And uh, Yuta kicked out of both of them, but then was put in the uh, the Bulldog Choke and went unconscious. So he lost the match, uh, and, and Moxley won the match, but Moxley was unable to, like, defeat him. He was unable to pin his shoulders or make him give up. He had to put him unconscious in order to get his hand raised. So I thought this was just... It was fantastic. And the look on Moxley's face afterwards. The one, we see too much of the bug eyes and the jaw-dropping Tom and Jerry cartoon-style face in wrestling on the two count. I can't stand it. They do it too much. I know, look, there's a reason, obviously, it's done in AEW and WWE so much on the indies. It really drives me nuts because it's like there's no camera there or there's not enough people to do this. So don't do it. Just stay on your opponent, for Christ's sakes. But in this case with Moxley, it worked because I just hit this guy with, I thought, everything, and he still somehow kicked out. And then to see his face as Danielson gets in the ring behind Regal, who's all excited and doesn't, he wants to kick him, he's so happy. He wants to kiss him, he's so happy. You see Regal out there, and Danielson looks over at Moxley, who's looking over at Danielson. The whole thing, I thought, went (laughs) perfectly, and... Even the gusher that you'd have got, I mean, it looked so good. I mean, aesthetically, as is, is nasty as this may sound, blood doesn't bother me. You know, it's never bothered me in wrestling or anything like that. It doesn't bother me in general. So to see that face, I mean, just every the color of the blood, everything about it, I thought, couldn't have been any better. Now, does this help Rampage long term? No, unfortunately not because of the position that it's in, but it certainly helps out Wheeler, Utah, and wherever they're going with this Blackpool Combat Club when it comes to Dynamite. I saw the uh, New Japan show over the weekend where uh, your main man, Zack Sabre Jr., didn't win the IWGP heavyweight title, Mike. Still kick your rear end. Hey, listen. First off, no, he couldn't. Second off, I, I advocated on numerous shows, and I will advocate again on this show, that he should have won the title. But he didn't. Really? And I I did. I thought that he should win the title because, you know, they they announced the lineup for the next show, and, uh, you know, it's a stadium show again, and they want to sell a bunch of tickets. And so, you know, after, after Okada won, you know, he has to do his challenge. 
and uh, he challenges Naito. And, uh, you know, even Naito comes out and goes, I was actually leaving. I was not expecting you to say my name. <laughs> but, hey, if you want to have the match, we can have it. And I just thought, bro, listen, I know the match is going to be great, okay? I've seen this match a thousand times, okay? I think they've already done the match twice in 2022. It's April, okay? It'll be May. This will be the third time they've done this match. And I'm all for, you know, seeing great matches, but, I mean, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't bring up the fact that I really like watching Bianca Belair and Dewdrop. But when they do the match four times in six weeks, I'm over it, okay? So the point is, bro, I've seen Okada and Naito a thousand times. Uh, like, if Zack Sabre Jr. would have won the title, yeah, you're going to see matches you've seen before, but now it's different. Zack Sabre Jr. is the champion. Zack Sabre Jr. defending the title against this guy, against that guy, against this guy. And the other thing is, when Zack Sabre Jr. is the champion, every match that he has, because it's, I'm not saying he's a weak champion, but he's not Okada. So if you put Zack Sabre Jr. in there with anybody, you're going to have a portion of fans that think, we might have a title change here tonight. So there's a little bit of an added intrigue in a lot of these matches as opposed to, you know, I guess maybe Naito could beat Okada, but, I mean, okay, why? Am I wrong well, here? I want well, something new and different. I want to see some new main events with some different people. I'd like to see, you know, Okada did, or uh, Zach did that promo, and he's like, I want to defend this title against, um, what's his face? Osprey. Uh, Osprey. Great! I'd love to see Osprey and Zack Sabre Jr. for the title. Instead, I'm getting Okada and Naito for the 5,000th time. Apparently because, well, you know, we got to sell tickets to a, a dome show, and it's our strongest match. Well, it's your strongest match if you haven't done it twice already this year, number one. And number two, maybe we shouldn't be running a stadium right now, especially <laughs> yeah, if we're true. limiting everything to half capacity. That's, anyway. That is absolutely true. And you're right. I mean, I look, if you wanted to put it on Zach, I, I understand. The only reason that I'll give him a pass here for Naito and Okada is because it is going to be such a good match. And what do we see at the end of it? You know, and I think that could be really important, too. You know, I don't know when Ibushi's coming back. Osprey is obviously in the mix. Osprey, it's interesting, too, because he's going to face Tanahashi now, right, for the, for the U.S. title. You know, him... It'll be interesting to see if he takes the U.S. title. It would make the most sense. Tanahashi could come over here, too. I mean, you know, Tanahashi with the U.S. title as an ambassador would be fantastic. But I could see Osprey with it. And you talked about new blood. One thing that tag division has needed desperately because it's been so much with Zach and Taichi and with G.O.D. and with very few tag teams, Great Ocon and Jeff Cobb. I love that. I hope they can develop some opponents for them. I couldn't hope they look that that's a team too, because Okan is still young in his career. He did not spend a lot of time in America. Very little. In fact, almost none him coming over to the States with Jeff Cobb to do things in new Japan strong or to possibly do things as the, the doors open. I love that team. I love that combination. And with Osprey, you know, you belt them all up in some sort of way. Uh, no complaints out of me. You know what? I actually, almost argued. I think Tanahashi should win that uh, that U.S. title. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, I'll tell well, you why. It keeps Osprey in the world title mix. Well, because uh, New Japan is getting visas for a lot of the foreign talent to come over, and if all of these foreign talents are coming over, that's a lot of brand new matches in Japan for Will Osprey. Whereas, you know, I love Tanahashi and everything like that, but, I mean, he's getting older. He doesn't move as well as he's not. They're not going to build the promotion around him. And Tanahashi is a guy, and Osprey would as well, but, I mean, you may as well use Osprey in Japan and send Tanahashi to America to sell a bunch of tickets for these shows where they're going all over the place. I mean, listen, I love Will Osprey, okay? But if New Japan is coming to my town... They're running split tours. One's going to Bothell, one's going to Everett. One show's got Osprey, and one show's got Tanahashi. No disrespect to Osprey, but I'm going to go see Tanahashi because he's an all-time legend, and God only knows how many more chances I'm going to have to see him having a match in Bothell. If it were Bothell, it would be zero. Whereas I'm pretty sure 
that if I go to a bunch of shows over the next few years, I'm going to have plenty of opportunities to see Will Ospreay, you know, for some big show here or there or whatever. So I think that it would be better off to have Tanahashi win the title, come to the U.S., leave Ospreay in Japan, and we got a bunch of programs with guys coming over. Talk about a former New Japan guy for a minute, just because it took place on SmackDown. I didn't have a chance to hear any of your shows that Ah. you did, but Shinsuke Nakamura uh, being the guy who I I, look, I because I know some people have been negative on him. Was wondering if you were. It is like I like this for just this reason. Cruise control Nakamura at this point in his career. I love it for him. I love the fact he gets to go to the beach every day and all that sort of good stuff, but. I know he can turn it on for one more match. And I think under the circumstances, because they don't have anybody there and anybody ready and it's not Drew and your Gunther is not all that. They don't have anybody. So at least I know I'll get Roman Reigns and Nakamura in at least one good match. If well, nothing may else, I? even though the story sucks. May I? Sure. I'm not sure you're going to get that match. And that's well, that the main case, reason. Boo. <laughs> that's the main reason I hated this segment, because Roman Reigns was supposed to show up on Raw and tell us what's next. So Roman Reigns shows up on Raw, and he says, I'm going to tell you what's next on SmackDown. So we go to SmackDown, and Roman Reigns doesn't tell us what's next. Nakamura comes out. They literally lay him out like the world's biggest geek. And when it was over, he still didn't tell me what was next. And I thought, I hope what's next is not Nakamura after that angle. How in the world are you going to make me care about... I mean, yeah, I like Nakamura. I'm sure he could have a good match with Roman. But that's your build to Nakamura being the next challenger after Roman unified two belts against Brock Lesnar? So I think he's going to go to Raw, and there's going to be a challenger from Raw. And Nakamura just got geeked out because... I don't know. I could be wrong, but I thought that segment I blame Boogs. Oh, poor Boogs. Back in a moment, Observer Live. All righty. Well, Ross tonight is noted. And uh, in about an hour, it's going to be myself and filthy Tom Lawler. If you want the full review of the SmackDown show from Friday night, we're going to do that, as well as uh, this week's New Japan Strong. And, in fact, I'm going to watch the uh, filthy Tom match from last week's New Japan Strong with Clark Connors. Where, spoiler, everybody, Tom beat him. Which, uh, did you apologize to him yet? I thought that Clark might have had his number, especially when Clark he promised to win as a babyface. You're not supposed to do that unless you're going to win, dude. Stop backing all these horses against the stallion himself, filthy Tom Lawler, your New Japan strong open weight champion, and halftime festivities at the Clippers game. See that? Yeah, check his Twitter before you do that show. Check his Twitter. What did he do? He and uh. Finley and uh, I believe it was uh, Jonah all lifted up the Clippers mascot and took him out onto the court and I believe maybe threw him across uh, the floor and then made out with the cheerleaders, but I didn't see the entire clip. Wow. How about that? Well, maybe I'll check that out. I know his Twitter is at Filthy Tom Lawler. And I know my Twitter is at Brian Alvarez. And I know my cameo is F4W Online. All cameos this week from beautiful San Francisco, California. You want to see what it looks like, everybody? Let's see if you can see. I'm going to mess this up somehow. But, oh, man, look at that. Ah, the Hollywood Hills, even though we're not in Hollywood. Yeah, I can, apparently that's just my fingers. I covered <laughs> up the camera. Can you see that, everyone? No? Ah, there you go. There we go. Hey! Dom, I'll see you Friday. See you later, everybody. Wrestling Observer Live.